Good morning. It's good to see everybody who's made it out and about with us again this morning. Uh, it is a wonderful day. Had a, a wonderful song service. And I appreciated everybody singing out. And again, I think Bobby thought so as well. As we, as we think, I'm just glad he didn't look at me. I'm just going to put that out there. I saw him glancing, but, you know, I'm just glad he didn't pay too much attention to me. You know, when we, we think about song, I always enjoy singing. I've always enjoyed it. I've always enjoyed singing with those uh, who like to sing and be uh, grouped together in song. And I love to, to hear people sing praises to God and, and be part of that. The question I want to ask, I guess, to begin this is, who taught you Jesus loves me? I mean, that is probably the first song about Jesus that we heard or listened to. You know, it could have been your mother or your grandmother. It could have been a Sunday school teacher. It could have been anybody. Just somebody who took interest in you and taught you the song, Jesus Loves Me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And when we think about that, that just those simple verses, they have such a great meaning to it. That as we grow from, from childhood into adulthood, uh, we start wanting to ask the question, we should be asking the question, well, where in the Bible does it tell me God loves me? Where does it tell me that Jesus loves me? You know, that, that, to know the answer to that question would be to know one of the most important answers to any question you could ever ask. How do I know that God, that Jesus loves me? And so this morning I, I want to, to develop that just a little bit. How do I know that God loves me? You know, when we start thinking about that question, the, the thing I, I want to bring up, we have to bring up, is the, the seriousness of sin. You know, have you ever sat and thought about sin? I mean, not just to accomplish sin, but really what it is. This idea that we are going to do something that goes against a most holy God. That we are co going to commit an act where God would essentially take note of and hold it against us because we're going to have to one day pay for that. And we, we might think of ourselves so insignificant that he might not see us. But he does. See, when we start looking at this idea of sin and the seriousness of sin, I, I want us to look at a couple verses in Romans, and then we're going to go to Matthew 7. When we look at Romans in chapter 3, what, he, what Paul has done up until then is discuss sin. In Romans in chapter 1, he had described the sins of the Gentiles, or those that who are not God's people, and it culminates into things like homosexuality, where they have traded in what God wanted for something else, idolatry and things of this nature. And then in Romans in chapter 2, he addresses the Jews, because they were at one time God's chosen people, and and what they've done was they did the same thing the Gentiles were doing. There wasn't any better. In fact, they would condemn the Gentiles and do the same thing. You know, it's that same idea. When you point your finger to, at someone, you have how many pointing back, right? And so the idea is they also were sinful. And then when you go to, to Romans in chapter 3, what we find is Paul quoting, uh, quoting from the Psalms in, in verse 10. He says, there is none righteous, no, not one. No, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And he goes on to talk about some of the severity of their sins. And you, start, you sit down and think about this idea. Generally, when we talk about somebody that is good, they might, they might treat people well, but they may live a horrible life. I mean, do you know people like that? They'd give you the shirt off their back, but they'd also lie and take it back. I mean, think about that for a second. And when we start thinking about this idea of sin, you know, a good person would be someone who would never sin, not go against what God says. They would always do what is right. The, Paul said, quoted the uh, Psalms to say, nobody has done that. And he goes on to talk about this in verse 23 of Romans 3. He says, for all have sinned. And falling short of the glory of God. Now there's some wonderful verses we're going to get to. But I want us to think about that for a second. We all have sinned. That, that, it, that The word translated all have sinned. That, that one idea is that sometime in the past we have committed some kind of sin. And that's something to think about. 
Because when I look around in this room, and you can do it too, but the one thing that we can say that we all have in common is that sometime we have sinned. We have done what God said not to do, or we have not done something God said to do. We, we've fallen short in that. That's you, that's me, that's, that's everybody we'll see today. And the idea of fall short of the glory of God, we all have sinned. The sin is the, is the one point. Fall short is continuing action. We still are not who God wants us to be. We still do not reach that mark. We still are not good enough. We keep failing. We keep failing. And that's a serious matter. Because when we look at the end of Romans in chapter 6, and verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when you start breaking those things down, wages is what you earn. So like tomorrow morning when you get up and you go to work, you know, and you, you put in your eight hours or so, and then at the end of the week or in two weeks or in a month, depends on your pay schedule, you expect, you expect to get your wages, your, your paycheck. Well, only th only thing that sin is going to bring to us is death. It isn't going to bring us good things. That's a serious matter. That is so serious. Because we have all sinned, which means we all have a paycheck come to us, that we don't want to cash. I mean, I have a check somewhere that I have not cashed. It is a refund check for one penny. That is not, not from the U.S. government. I paid a cell phone bill or something, and they wrote me a check for one penny. So, yeah, I didn't want to cash it. I was like, if they're going to write that, you know, that, that is some important stuff. I need to hold on to it. But could you imagine if you looked, and it said pay to the order of, and it had your name, and it said death, signed by God, because that's what we earned. I don't want to cast that check. Do you want to cast the check? I don't want that check cashed. But there's an end of that verse as well. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Jesus is the one that cast that check. See, when we think about our lives, we're all going somewhere. I mean, if you just got up, you know, say tomorrow morning, or say you, you said, you know, I have some time to kill. I'm just going to go and I'm going to sit in this hallway. You know, there's a most beautiful view out in this hallway. I never really see anybody taking it. But you could go sit in the hallway, and when the sun's beaming through there, there's no warmer place in the building. Now, at this time, it might be good, or might want to go outside and look. But the idea is when you look at all the beautiful scenery, you see the mountains, you can see the mist in the morning coming off of them. But what you see is also, if you look close enough, there's all these cars going by. See, when you see all the cars going by, you, you might start to ask the question, well, where would somebody be going? I mean, if you were to sit here all night long, there are people who drive by this building. Now, I'm not sitting here all night long, but every time I come by here, there's somebody going by. Now, not just me, right? But the idea is there's, there's people going somewhere all the time. You say, well, what is there in Greenville, Tennessee, that somebody needs to be busy enough riding around all hours a day going? That's where are they going? And see, when we start thinking about, about sin and, and the seriousness of sin, Everybody is going somewhere. Everybody is going somewhere. See, when we think about sin, we don't think about that, do we? We don't think that sin is a vehicle that we get in and we go somewhere in it. But sin takes us somewhere. See, when we look in, in Matthew in chapter 7, Jesus gives this encouragement. In verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for uh, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, if we were to, to get this picture, this broad way and this narrow way, we don't have to go very far. See, if you look in front of us, we have a two-lane road. There's not a whole lot more you can do. You can just go one way or the other. I mean, we can't stack people up there. But if you just went over the little hill here and you got on the bypass, you can fit any number of people there. 
I mean, it's a fort. I mean, it's a lot bigger. But have you noticed this as you travel down the interstates? That the big road that sometimes is six lanes follows some little two-lane road. Now, how much easier is it to get on the freeway and just put the pedal down and just go? I mean, there's not a whole lot of cur curves. It, it just, you can hold it right open. You, you can make it from point A to point B, maybe not the safest, but quicker than looking at that little small two-lane road where all the scenery is. See, if you really want to see what's going on or in the world, you know, you really want to get on that little two-lane road because... You see all the good stuff, but it's a whole lot harder to drive it because there might be some really bad curves in that one, and you're not going to be able to drive near as fast and be safe. Now, you can try to travel it fast, but you won't be safe. See, the idea of life is, is everybody can get on that broad road. You don't even have to think about it. You can just put life on cruise control and just go, and sin will let you. Sin will let you turn on cruise control and just go as fast as your little heart wants you to go. It will allow you to do that. Why is sin serious? Because it can get you places faster than you can stop yourself. You will just go. You don't have to think about it. I mean, really, how many of us live life on autopilot? It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what we watch. It doesn't matter where we go. We're just on it, living life to the fullest, just wide open. What has sin done? Blinded us to the reality there's another way of living. There's another way to get from this place to the next. It's a narrow way. But it's there. Seriousness of sin. Where would you go today if you left this earth? When was the last time you really thought about that? Where would you end up if you left earth right now? Where would you go? I know where the Broadway goes. It goes to a place called destruction, somewhere you don't want to go. And you don't want nobody else going there either. That's a place of torment you do not want to end up. And yet there are people on that road. The narrow, the narrow road goes to a place called life. And there's few who's going to find it because sin keeps them on that broad way. Notice, notice in verse 21. So if you put 13 and 14 and verse 21 through 23 together in my mind, in my opinion, these are some of the scariest verses in all of Scripture. So why? Because Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. And you say, well, these people are not bad people. I mean, they're prophesying, they're speaking for God. They're not bad people. But they're on the wrong road. They're on the wrong road. Have we not cast out demons in your name? You remember what Jesus said when he was accused of casting out demons by the ruler of demons, Beelzebub? He says, how, how can I even do that? A house divided among itself cannot stand. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. A, you, know, you can only come get the goods of the strong man if you bind him, then you can plunder him. I mean, you think about that, that reaction. He says, it, it, you're not casting out demons by the devil. It doesn't work. They're casting out demons. In Jesus' name. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. The many wonders in his name. Absolutely. What's the problem? They're on the wrong road. They're on that Broadway. Notice what it says in verse 21 at the end. He who does the will of my Father in heaven. But he who does. It doesn't say no there. 
Isn't, isn't that interesting? That Jesus did not sit back and say, He who knows the will of my Father. See, he doesn't say that. It doesn't say believes. He who believes in the will of my Father it doesn't say that. He gives an action. He who does those things. And you might sit back and say, well, how did these good people end up on this wrong road? You know, that's a really good question that Jesus gives a really good answer to. Notice verse 15. He says, beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. False teachers help them get there. False teachers help them get there. False prophets, those who acted and sounded like they say good things for God, put them on a wrong road. You sit back and say, that's pretty serious. So how do I know that Jesus loves me? It's in Romans chapter 5. We talked about some of the scariest verses. Let's look at a very comforting verse. Notice what it says. Starting in verse 6. Paul says, For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, I, I want us to really think about that for a second. When we were without strength, we, who does that include? You know, have you ever sat and thought about all the things the Apostle Paul said about himself? Have you ever pondered about those things that he says about himself? The Apostle said, Paul says, when I was without strength, when we were without strength, in due time or when the time is right, Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly? Those who do not act the way God desires them to act. See, it, it's, when, it's when people are acting unlike God would have them to act or unlike the characteristics of God that Jesus died. He goes on to say, For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, and yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Now think about it. Here's somebody who's known to do the right things. He might not tell you things you like to hear, but a morally upright person. May hurt your feelings by some of the things he says, that you need to live life this way. Comes up that he needs some help or he's going to die. Would you be willing to offer it up for him? Scarcely would one die for like that. A good man. Somebody, if you need him, you could call. He'd be right there. If you need it fixed, he'd fix it. If you needed to li him to listen, he'd listen. If you needed him to talk to you, he'd talk to you. A good man. One that would give you the shirt off his back and not require it back. Somebody for him might step in front of a bus and take it for him. to Push him out of the way. The world needs more men like that. But God demonstrates his unlove toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Somehow we've got this idea in our mind. And I don't know exactly where it comes from. Except when we start thinking about sin and in our relationship to God because we have sinned or we continue in sin. And sometimes we get this idea that we're just not good enough. That God doesn't love me enough. That if I change my life and get my life right, then God will accept me. But you know what Paul said? Even when you were ungodly and not doing what God wanted, Jesus died for you. See, we don't get our life right and then start following God. That's not how it works. You get your mind right about who God is, and he will fix the rest. But you've got to get your mind right and say, I want to follow him. Will your life be perfect when you come out of the warrior grave of baptism? No. No. Are you going to be tempted by the same things you were? Yes. 
Do you have to be perfect for God to love you? No. See, that is an amazing thing. It was when our life was just a mess. That's when Jesus died. He died because he loved us that much. I mean, this is God's love on display. Demonstrates his own love toward us. Now, really think about it. Think about really what that looks like. See, when we go back to to Mark chapter 14, and Mark is the, the, smart, the shortest gospel. And so his account of things is smaller. Huh. When was the last time you sat down and you thought about the prayer? The prayer he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. How Jesus is pouring his heart out. And he's sweating. And it becomes like drops of blood. And he goes... And he says this in verse 36, so it's Mark 14, 36. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. All things are possible. Did he give God honor and glory in that prayer? Absolutely. Anything that can be done, God can do it. So what is he asking for? Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but you will. The cup of what? The cup of suffering. Take it away. He knows what's getting ready to happen. I mean, just think about it. What are you going to be doing in two hours? You might know and you might not know. Jesus knew what was going to happen in two hours. Jesus knew what was going to happen the next day. And Jesus is saying, take the cup away. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Not my will, but your will. Jesus prays this three times. He prays it. Immensely and intensely. He is A1 praying this. After a third time, he gets up, goes, finds his apostle sleeping again, and says, Let's go. Let's go. There's a mockery of a trial. The Last Supper was the Last Supper. And through this market of a trial all night, they end up bringing him to Pilate the next day. And could you imagine? Here it is, the people that he's trying to help, the people that he's been teaching for three, three and a half years, the people he's healed, they're sick and caused their blind to see. And they're all there. And here Pilate, is wanting to let Jesus go. He puts up Barabbas. He puts up Barabbas so maybe they will choose Jesus, the king of the Jews, which he kind of says tongue-in-cheek, I imagine. Or this murderer, this thief. And it is the elders of the people, the rulers of the people, who say, release Barabbas and give us Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify Jesus. What wrong has he done? Let his blood be in us. But they didn't exactly know what they were praying for. Crucify him. Crucify him. What evil has he done? Crucify him. So he gives them what they want. He washes his hands of the matter. That doesn't take away responsibility. Notice what it says, Mark 15, 15. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus. After he had scourged him to be crucified, 
Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him in purple. It's a color of royalty. And they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they began to salute him, hail king of the Jews. Then they spat on, struck him on the head with the reed and spat on him. Bowing the knees, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put, on, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Serenium, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming by out of the country, and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place called Gotha, which is translated, place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with murder drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them, to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it in a reed, and offered it to him to drink saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and breathed his last. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man it was the Son of God. Now you think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. You know, you know, when you read the book of Hebrews, there were Christians and they were under some immense persecution. So immense, they said that to get away from this, we'll just leave Christianity and go back to Judaism. I mean, the temple's still there. And so, so we'll just go back and we'll worship like we used to worship. And so they were leaving Jesus. And so when you read the book of Hebrews, what you find is the Hebrews writers encouraging them not to go back, not to return. Because Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is a better lawgiver, has a better covenant, has better promises. He's better. You read the book book of Hebrews, you find out Jesus is better. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, when he's encouraging them, why is he encouraging them? They, they're suffering. When you read Hebrews 11, these people made it. Because these people can make it, they could too. And so the, the Hebrews writer just gives this in, in chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by go so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. But listen to verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Now wait a minute. He cried. He was sweating. You heard the prayer. You heard it. All things are possible for you. Take his cup from me. But there's joy? 
What's the joy? The joy was that in his death he could bring life. In his death, he can bring life. So we don't often think about it that way, do we? I mean, we just observe the Lord's Supper and we sit back and say, what did that mean? You know, we, we make a reference uh, of the, the bread being the body and the cup being the representation of the blood. And, and as we take of that, we should think about what Jesus did on the cross. He had joy and yet he says he despised the shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, despising the shame. He endured the cross and despised what was going on. You have people who came, that Jesus helped, and, and, and he came to, to help them see who God is and to know their, God's will for them more bet readily, and yet they're wanting him to die, and, and it becomes a public spectacle, and they're, they're wanting him to have Elijah come and wanting him to come off the cross, and he has to die for them to live. But there was joy. There was joy because in doing that, he gives us life. He's able to give us life. Now, when you sit and we think about these things, you go to Romans chapter 6, and in Romans chapter 6, what Paul does is describe how we're free from sin. In fact, it is verse 7 where it says, He who has died has been freed from sin. You say, well, how do they do that? How did they do that? See, how, how did they die to become freed from sin? Notice if you look again in verse 17 of Romans chapter 6, he says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. What, what doctrine did they believe? In verse 18, And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. They're free from sin, they can serve righteousness. What did they believe? It's in the first six verses. It's in the first six verses. What then? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. No, we don't sin more to get more grace. Grace is great, but we don't sin just to get more grace. Because he asked the question, How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Verse 2, died to sin. Verse 7, died to sin. Verse 17, they've been delivered from sin. Verse 18, they, become, they were set free from sin. How did they do that? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, us? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised by the dead from the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, we. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, we. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Did you notice the pronouns? What happened to Jesus? He died, he was buried, and he rose again. We includes Paul. Paul, how was you set free from sin? I died, I was buried with Jesus in baptism, I came out, I live a new life. What did the Romans do? They died. They were buried with Jesus in baptism. They rose up to live a new life. See, when we start looking at this, we sit back and say, you know, we are all on a big road going somewhere. Every single one of us is on a road going somewhere. But Jesus loved you and I enough that he made a way to get off that broad road. He loved you enough to die so you don't have to continue down the broad way of life. You can travel the narrow way. 
You do not have to die in your sins. You can die in Jesus and have eternal life. So how does Jesus love me? That's a really good question. My sins and the terrible things I have done separated me from God a long time ago. You can say the same thing. The Bible bears it out. Even when we were ungodly and sinful, Jesus died in our place so we wouldn't have to. He took on the penalty of our sins in his body so we don't have to pay for them when this life is over. That we don't have to stay on that broad way the rest of our life into eternity, but we can get off. We can start walking the narrow way. Jesus cast the checks that we didn't want to cash so we can have life. You know, it's very interesting when we think about it. You think about where the broad way goes, it never calls it eternal life. But if you look where the narrow way leads us and those who are in Christ, where does it take you? Always leads to life. Life is in Jesus. He gave his life for you so you could live life. Jesus loves you. He's the example of that love. The big question I want to ask you today is, do you love Jesus? You know, we don't have a whole lot of those songs that we sing to our children about how I love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Are you living for him? That's a good question. If you were to go back and you think about the span of your life here on this earth, if I was to peek into your life, would it be one that follows Jesus or follows sin? See, I can't answer that for you. But you know the answer to it. Today, if you're not following Jesus, why not follow him? Why not? Why carry that burden of sin any longer? If you've never yet put Christ on baptism, why not do it today? If you've done that and wandered astray, repent, pray, and come back. Or maybe you have any doubts of sin, you let it be known as we sing this song of invitation.